It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, before I begin, I just think it's important to acknowledge uh, what many Ontarians are facing uh, with all of the, uh, the flooding that's been happening. So everything from the work that the Meshkegawak Council and the Emergency Measures Ontario have done to help uh, evacuate to the Kesheshwan uh, residents, to the volunteers and the Army and emergency response workers uh, across uh, uh, Ottawa and uh, Muskoka Lakes, Bancroft, Hall um, uh, Huntsville, uh, Renfrew County now, apparently, uh, things have been very tough, and Ontarians have pulled together to help each other, because uh, that's what our province is all about. And I think it's important to acknowledge the work that people are doing. But my, my first question is to the Minister of Education, Speaker. For weeks, the Ford government has insisted that their budget cuts would not lead to cuts in the classroom. On Friday, the government announced the grants for student needs allocation, and school boards are confirming what we already knew. Large class sizes, larger class sizes, fewer teachers, fewer courses available for students. We're joined today by students, education workers, teachers, and school trustees. They deserve a straight answer from the government speaker. Will the minister admit that this is a cut in per-student funding that will inevitably lead to cuts in the classroom? Questions to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I am so happy to have an opportunity to speak about the facts, the true facts about where we're going in education in Ontario to get it back on track. And first and foremost, everybody in this House and everybody looking and listening to Question Period today needs to know we're investing more money in education like never before. And over and above that, we're making sure we're investing the money properly so the number one priority, student achievement, is achieved and realized once and for all. You know, it's interesting because here is the fact, Speaker. We're investing almost $25 billion through the grants for student needs. And essentially, for people listening and, and uh, watching today, grants for student needs is essentially the operating envelope, if you will, that school boards Response. need. So we're investing almost $25 billion in the operating funds for the next school year in 2019-2020, and not one teacher, not one teacher will lose their job because of our proposed changes. Once and for all, you Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Well, what every person watching Question Period today needs to know, Speaker, is the grants for student needs have been cut by the government, which is not what the minister has acknowledged. And in fact, there is an inflationary cut as well in their budget to education. So they're not even funding to, uh, to inflation, which means, of course, even more cuts to education. Look, school boards are carefully reviewing the latest news from the ministry, but some things are quite clear already, Speaker. The Toronto board says they're facing a multi-million dollar shortfall. So that's not just the official opposition, Speaker. That's the Toronto board. The Peel board says that course options will be lost. Again, not the official opposition, but the Peel Board. Toronto Catholic Board ch uh, Chair says they're losing $655,000 in grants and em eliminating 95 at-risk jobs for Question. youth. These are real cuts affecting real Ontarian speaker. Will the minister put an end to her cuts and restore funding to education? Once again, the Minister of Education. I'm going to stand in this house every day and put an end to the nonsense that we are hearing Dear from the members of the opposition party. We're talking about people's livelihoods. We're talking about people's jobs. And shame on you for all the anxiety and all of the fear-mongering that you're causing uh, throughout Ontario. Because, Speaker, the fact of the matter is this. We're increasing spending in education. Session come to in order. the budget, people saw where we're investing $700 million more than the previous government and that is going to make a difference right in the classroom here, here, here. our GSN is up by almost uh, it's going to be to almost 25 billion dollars and that is a huge significant piece of the puzzle when it comes to make sure we are 
securing what matters most in Ontario, and that is student achievement. For goodness sakes, Response. we are making sure that not one student is, or one teacher is going to lose their job because we are setting aside a historic $1.6 billion in here, attrition here. protection funding. Not one teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the minister keeps denying it, but nobody believes her anymore. The Ford government is making cuts to classrooms, and our students are the ones who are going to be paying the price. Right. Last week, students at Cothra Park Secondary School in Mississauga were called into the auditorium in their school, and staff informed them that they would have to reselect uh, re their courses for their graduating year, and that they might even have to take summer school or night school to pick up electives in order to graduate on the time frame that they expected to graduate. The Premier can't stick his head in the sand and claim that students are fear-mongering or that the opposition is fear-mongering. These classroom cuts are real, and they are hurting students, and they are damaging those students' futures. Will the minister stand up to the Premier, stand up for the students, Question. and get back to the cabinet table and make sure that these cuts are reversed? Members, please take their seats. Minister to reply. Speaker, I'm going to stand up against all of the nonsense that that leader of the opposition I'm telling you, we are investing money like never before. The fact of the matter is, we're increasing our funding in student transportation. We're increasing our funding for school capita. We're going to be building schools and continuing to repair schools. We're going to be increasing our funding in French language education. We're going to be increasing our funding by $90 million for special education. And again, Speaker, this is nonsense what is being perpetuated by the opposition party. We are making sure that our number one priority is student achievement and they have the courses and they have the learning experiences that they deserve and we look forward to working with school boards to make sure that they themselves protect what matters most and that is student achievement and Response. the learning environment in the classroom. Thank you very much. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is to the Acting Premier. On Friday, the Premier travelled to Ottawa, where he made the surprising admission that climate change is real. Um, it was likely contributing to the flooding that we're seeing in communities across Ontario, and that we should expect more of them. Now, if the Premier truly believes that, why has the government slashed funding to conservation authorities for flood, flood management programs by half? Questions to the Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Energy. Referred to the Minister of Energy. First of all, Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, acknowledge the Leader of the Opposition's uh, comments earlier and commend and thank all of the people, organizations, ministry officials, volunteers uh, throughout the province who've worked uh, uh, in response to these floods. Here, here. Understanding the impacts of climate change is essential to help manage risks uh, across the economy to improve our understanding of how climate change will impact the province. We plan to launch Ontario's first ever climate change impact assessment. This is a key part of our Made in Ontario Environment Plan, Mr. Speaker. We'll access the best science and information to better understand where the province is vulnerable and know which regions and economic sectors are most likely to be impacted. The previous Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, supported by the NDP, wasted taxpayers' dollars on actions that did little to prepare the province for the costs and impacts Spons. of climate change. That's changing under our government, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, I know that the Premier saw what I saw when I travelled to Ottawa this weekend. Thousands of volunteers scrambling to hold back rising water. Heartbreaking losses to homes and businesses. Damage and devastation. We're joined today by families from Kosheshawan, who are yet again being evacuated from their homes following disastrous flooding. The Premier admitted that once-a-century floods are now happening almost every year. If that's the case, why is the Ford government cutting the very services that could help us deal with it, including a 50% cut to the Ministry of Indigenous Affairs. Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. 
Well, first of all, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ontario's very first impact assessment will enable us to make planning and investment decisions that are better informed by the likely impacts of, cha of a changing climate. It will ensure better long-term management of public and private assets and infrastructure and reduce costs to government businesses and households, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, the member opposite's uh, question does not reflect the reality, Mr. Speaker, in terms of our investment to Indigenous affairs. We continue to be committed uh, to uh, offering a, a, an array of programs and services uncompromised, Mr. Speaker, in our efforts to modernize Indigenous Affairs Ontario and work effectively uh, with our Indigenous uh, stakeholders across the province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, I'll tell you about the impact, Speaker. The impact is severe, and it's happening right now, not some time down the road when they get an impact study done. The Premier is not just cutting flood management services while well, the impacts are happening, but the Ford budget also scrapped the 50 million tree project that, among other things, wow. mitigated flood risk while fighting climate change. Sure. And this doesn't even mention the Premier's decision to roll back environmental protections, scrap climate change programs, download even more costs to municipal governments that are scrambling to protect their communities. And let's not even talk about the fact that we don't even have an independent environmental commissioner anymore in the province of Ontario. They are willing to spend millions of dollars helping Andrew Scheer by slapping campaign stickers on every gas pump in Ontario, but they can't find the funds to protect families from flooding much less protect our province Question. from climate change. Is this Ford government prepared to revisit the devastating cuts that they announced in their budget? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Energy again to reply. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll take a crack at that kitchen sink question and make the following observation, Mr. Speaker. The, 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 end, the, the new Democratic protesters here are bent on exploiting Order. every issue uh, that they can possibly do, Mr. Speaker, and it doesn't reflect the facts uh, on the ground, Mr. Speaker. She mentioned the carbon tax. Let's just talk about that for a moment. Listen to this. Boris Hordinsky owns Hordinsky Farms in Innisfil, one of the top onion farms in the country. He produces over 90,000 metric tons of grade A onions, grown, packed, and shipped everywhere. He says in the end, we'll have to work these costs into our end product, into the onion. The consumer will end up paying the additional costs when they go into a supermarket to buy some onions or other uh, products, Mr. Speaker. He believes that the number is nowhere near the $307 postcard we've all been sent by the federal government. In fact, he says it's, going to, it's not going to be $1,200 or $1,500. It's Response? likely going to be an additional two to $3,000, Mr. Speaker. We are not going to miss an opportunity to inform the people of Ontario how much the federal Liberals and the provincial NDP want on a cost of living for the people of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, a member from Meskigawak, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Today, 250 members from Keshechewan First Nations are present at Queen's Park to remind the Minister of the province's responsibility towards the community. Speaker, for 17 times, people of Keshechewan, including children, elders, and people with disability, have been evacuated as a result of the yearly flood. This government had issued a rapid response to the th threat of flooding eastern Ontario, rightly so, Mr. Speaker, yet it has failed the affected people of Keshechewan. Will this government commit to expediting the land transfer process so that the relocation of Keshechewan can begin as quickly as possible, yes or no? Members, please take their seats. Minister for Energy, Northern Development and Mines and Indigenous Affairs. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And first, I'd like to commend the officials from my ministry, the Ministry of Indigenous Affairs, Ontario. In fact, ministry officials from uh, no less than five other, at least, ministries who have been working hard on a coordinated response under these difficult situations to make this displacement as seamless as possible. With respect to the member's specific request, Mr. Speaker, I've already taken action. I spoke with Grand Chief Alvin Fidler last week. We had a great conversation. I'll be meeting with Chief Friday today and Chief Grand Chief uh, Roseanne uh, Archibald to ensure that they know that Ontario stands ready at any time should the federal government decide to come forward and make plans to move this community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. Supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me remind the members of this House that the province is a signatory party of the March 31, 2017 Tripartite Framework, Framework Agreement. This agreement stipulates that both province and federal government would engage in short, mid, and long-term solutions for Kosheshwan. And these solutions include relocating the community to higher and safer grounds. Speaker, 90% of the community voted in favor of the relocation during the referendum held three years ago. My question, Minister, people have been waiting for 17 years, 17 years, and the province is responsible for this flooding. Promises are over. Will you honor the agreement that the province signed in 2017? Minister, to reply. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm very familiar with this situation, and I can assure the member opposite um, and the people of Kasechuan who are here today, Mr. Speaker, that Ontario stands ready. We will make every effort available to us, use every tool to participate in a process with the leadership of Kasechuan First Nations community, the federal government, and the provincial government, Mr. Speaker, to move forward. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is not about talking about it. It's about taking action, and I've sp spoken with Indigenous leaders Opposition in the province, Mr. Speaker, to ensure not only that, not only, Mr. Speaker, that we ensure that the, the, the safe dis displacement of those members happens now. But in the short to medium term, Mr. Speaker, there is a plan, a phased-in plan, which I've already had substantive discussions with Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler and plan to continue with the leadership of Kasechuan later this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that Kasechuan has a home Response. year round and this kind of displacement comes to an end. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Over the past week, we have seen flooding in many communities across Ontario, including severe flooding in Bracebridge, Huntsville, and Katrine in my riding of Perry Sound, Muskoka. I've seen the flooding in all these communities firsthand. I've spoken to the residents who are anxious about their safety and damage to their property. I know we have dedicated staff across the province monitoring the situation and responding with the support of the government. In Perry Sound, Muskoka, we also have dedicated municipal leaders and a huge number of, of uh, volunteers doing everything they can. Can the minister please tell this House what his ministry and our government are doing to mitigate the potential damage from the floodwaters? Questions to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka, for that question. I know he was out uh, with the Premier last week viewing firsthand uh, the damage in his areas. Our sympathies go out to everyone across Ontario who has been dealing with flooding, including my, in my riding of Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. On Friday, I visited the community of Constance Bay with Premier Ford, and I continued to visit communities in my riding over the weekend. As we deal with the high water levels, the Provincial Emergency Operations Centre has been fully activated, and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry has been working with our partners at the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Solicitor General, and across all three levels of government to coordinate an effective response. Together we have personnel and supplies strategically positioned across the province to respond to the needs of municipalities as they request assistance, and I want to thank all of the first responders and the volunteers who have put so much time to deal with this and to help those people who are suffering so greatly at this Thank time. Thank you. Supplementary question. And thank you, Minister, for that answer, Mr. Speaker. I understand water levels across much of eastern Ontario at, are at or have exceeded levels that have occurred in recent history. In Perry Sound, Muskoka, we are, we are seeing record high water levels. Residents of Bracebridge, Huntsville, and Katrine in Armour Township who are facing flooding have strong local leadership to rely upon. I've met with and remain in touch with uh, Bracebridge Mayor Graydon Smith, Huntsville Mayor Scott Aitchison, Armour Township Reeve, Bob McPhail. However, much of my riding also includes unorganized territories where, they're, where they are also experiencing flooding. Can the minister tell us what the role of the Ministry of Natural Resources plays in these unorganized territories? Once again, Minister, you, Speaker, to, the, to, the, to the member. As he knows, the municipal, municipalities lead the response in their community when circumstances such as, such as flooding occur. Municipalities continue to be in contact with the Provincial Emergency Coordination Centre and are leading the response. They are coping well with where they have been where there have been impacts and remain well equipped and prepared to respond to flooding. 
In unorganized townships, MNRF, my ministry, is the lead for flood emergency response, and we work with our partner ministries and agencies to support people living in those areas. For any Ontarian looking for information from my ministry on current or potential flood conditions, I ask them to visit ontario.ca slash flooding, where they will find maps, weather forecasts, and other tools to help to keep them safe. And we will be there when help is needed. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Kiewetnum. Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, for the uh, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. The agreement signed by uh, Canada, Ontario, and Kisashawan First Nation uh, in March 2017 is entitled, Together We Work for Hope. But I am hearing, but I'm not hearing uh, hope from the community. Members of Kisashawan who traveled here today uh, to hear about this government's response to the flooding. Mr. Speaker, um, will this government honor the health and the public safety commitments from 2017 agreement and move forward with relocating the community? Miigwech. Minister of Indigenous Affairs. I want to, I want to, I want to thank I'm going to ask the person who is shouting at the legislature to cease. You can't, you can't do what you're doing. If you don't stop, you're going to have to leave the chamber. We need to act now. We don't have time to Once again, I'll say we welcome guests to the Ontario Legislature. We're delighted to have you here, but you can't engage the members while you're in the visitors' gallery with uh, with comments. It's against the rules. It makes it impossible for the legislature to do its business. The minister had the floor, and I'll allow him to conclude his response. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the honourable member's question. What we do intend to honour, Mr. Speaker, is a commitment to the community of Kasachuan that ensures moving forward we work with the federal government and the leadership of Kasachuan First Nations community, Mr. Speaker, towards a plan that helps that community move to another location. I've had conversations with Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler last week. I'll be meeting with Chief Friday today. I have a call placed in with Minister O'Regan, who I've had good relationships with, Mr. Speaker, on some particular matters in northwestern Ontario. We intend to ensure moving forward, Mr. Speaker, that there is a plan in place for Kasachuan so that they don't have to be displaced year in and year out as a result of the flooding in the location that that community is currently in. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, in 2005, uh, more than 800 Kasachuan residents had to be evacuated due to E. coli contamination of the water supply. Many of the houses are full of mold due to uh, repeated flooding and trapped moisture. Mr. Speaker, there is no time to waste to fix these uh, health issues. The provincial government has a role to provide health care to the community through Treaty 9 and uh, 2017 agreement. What specific actions will this government take to protect the health of the community in the face of these floods? Take Once again, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the honourable member's question. As I've said earlier, we intend to honour a process, Mr. Speaker, that will see this solu a solution for Kasechuan First Nations community. It is unacceptable that they've moved, been moved out of their community almost every year for the past 15 to 17 years, Mr. Speaker, and that the conditions on in terms of housing are as a result uh, of that flooding, Mr. Speaker. That's why I've engaged the federal minister and the leadership of Kasechuan First Nations community, and frankly, the Grand Chief of Anishinaabeaski Nation, as well as the Grand Chief of uh, Ontario Chiefs, to, to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that we have the appropriate discussions and a plan in place moving forward, Mr. Speaker, that will ensure this problem, this problem is dealt with. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Hey. Mr. Speaker, 
My question is for the Minister of Labour. Minister, earlier this morning we observed a moment of silence and received unanimous consent to wear the yellow ribbon to remember and honour those who have died, been injured or been ill results of their jobs, including my father, who died of asbestosis when I was 18 on December 12, 1985. Last week and over the weekend, thousands of people across Ontario and in many places throughout Canada also paused to mark a national day of mourning. Participants included labour groups, employees, government offices, and, of course, friends and family, and survivors of those impacted by their workplace incidents. Can the minister inform this House how she, as the Minister of Labour, observed these occasions? Questions to the Minister of Labour. I thank the uh, member from Mississauga Lakeshore for the question and for all the fine work he's doing for his constituents and for sharing his story about his dad. And it is because of instances like your dad that uh, we have the Day of Remembrance. And last Friday, I had the honour of participating in the Day of Remembrance ceremonies at the WSIB. And yesterday, I joined the Lindsay and District Labour Council in my riding as well, as we reflected on the devastation caused by workplace injuries and fatalities. I heard from injured workers and their families and colleagues who have been affected by an injury, illness, or death in the workplace. I heard and felt their sorrow and their anger. These injuries and fatalities are not statistics. These are family members, friends, and neighbours. We must all make a commitment to do whatever we can to help make our workplaces safe, Mr. Speaker, and I know that we all continue to do that. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. I'm sure the ceremony was moving and thought-provoking. I know the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Labour has been travelling through the province hosting a number of roundtable discussions with employees, health and safety advocates and workers, all to identify why the Minister of Labour can improve its health and safety education, prevention and inspection process. When she attended a roundtable in my riding, more than 30 people came out to share their experiences and suggestions. She clearly, this is clearly an issue people care about deeply. Can you please tell us what else the Minister of Labour is doing to reduce and eliminate workplace injuries and fatalities? Minister of Labour. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do want to thank my parliamentary assistant, uh, the member from Burlington, Burlington, Jay McKenna, for all the great work that she has been doing at the Ministry of Labour. And it is one of our top priorities to ensure Ontario has the proper protections to prevent and eliminate workplace incidences, starting with education and prevention, and including legislation, regu regulation, inspections, and enforcement. And I am committed to ensuring that Ontario's workplaces do remain the safest in the world. So we are currently holding consultations on the development of Ontario's next occupational health and safety strategy, where we will drive home the message that everyone has a role to play. We need everyone, us as legislators, regulators, our health and safety partners, workers, employers, everyone, to promote health and safety to prevent further workplace injuries, fatalities, and illnesses. And Mr. Speaker, I'm confident we can do that. Thank you very much. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Last Monday, the Premier called in to Global News Radio and spoke live on the air to Alan Carter. Among other things, the Premier said, and I quote, if anyone needs support on legal aid, feel free to call my office. I'll guarantee you that you'll have legal aid, end quote. So will the Attorney General repeat in the House today the Premier's words that anyone who contacts the Premier's office will be guaranteed legal aid coverage? Or was the Premier just making stuff up again? Questions the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, as members of this House know well, uh, the Premier is very connected to the people of Ontario through his phone. phone calls and, and replies to cell phone messages because he wants to hear directly from Ontarians about what matters most. And what he hears over and over again, as we all do, Mr. Speaker, is what matters to the people of Ontario is to ensure that their government is doing everything they can to protect what matters most to the people of Ontario. That is making sure that our health care system 
system is sustainable, that our education, su su education is sustainable, and that our legal services system is sustainable as well, Mr. Speaker. Legal aid provides a vital service to the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and it will continue to do so, Mr. Speaker. We are committed to working. The Ministry of the Attorney General Spons. is committed to working with legal aid, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that those frontline services are preserved and are maintained, and they will, Mr. Speaker, under this government. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, it sounds to us like even the Premier is embarrassed by the cuts that he's proposing. But these cuts are real, and they won't go away just because he pulls over to call into a radio show with empty promises. Will the Attorney General admit today that the cuts to legal aid will leave people in our province, often the most vulnerable people, in fact, the most vulnerable people in our province, without legal coverage, and that the Premier was wrong to offer a guarantee that he had no intention of living up to, of honouring. Members, please take their seats. Once again, the Attorney General to reply. Mr. Speaker, empty promises were made in this House by members of the previous government who right promised right over there. people right of right Ontario there. a series of right over there. that added up to $15 billion that they knew they could Look not pay for. Yeah, Our it. government was elected by, with a strong mandate to restore fiscal Your sustainability to this province, Mr. Speaker, and that is what we are doing. Our budget that was delivered last year earlier this month is an important step in that way, Mr. Speaker. And so I am very proud of the proposals that we have made, of the policies that we have made to make sure that the programs that our government offers to the people of Ontario are done so in a sustainable way, Mr. Speaker. Opposition all the while protecting the frontline services that the people of this province need most. Health care, education, legal representation for those most in need, Mr. Speaker, will be preserved and maintained. Response. And those who need legal aid, Mr. Speaker, can call the Ministry of the Attorney General, can call legal aid, Mr. Speaker. The services will be there for here, those here. in need. Here, 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 here. Order. Order. The House will come to order. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My first words are for the victims of the floods in Ottawa and throughout the province. Thank you very much, volunteers. My question is to the Attorney General. To respect the rule of law, equality of everyone in front of the law was guaranteed, and that's why governments agreed that they should be held to account. And that meant that government should be able to be sued when it does something wrong. Absolutely. Now, Speaker, the government wants to change that. The Crown and Liability and Proceedings Act, which is buried in this year's budget, would limit the Ontario government's liability. The Premier himself said the, this move was designed to prevent suits from launching, launching lawsuits against his government. No other province in this country has wanted to codify the case law on Crown liability. Does the minister believe that Ontario judges are less able than their counterpart Question. to balance the rights of people and the government's policy scope. Questions to the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, uh, the people of Ontario um, have many ways to bring uh, proceedings against the Crown, uh, and those measures are still preserved. And so, um, the uh, you know, I would ask the member opposite to uh, stop putting out information, Mr. Speaker, that uh, will lead people, the people of Ontario, to not know what their rights are through the courts and tribunals of this province. Um, the measures that we have brought forward are to ensure that those who bring suits against the Crown are able to do so in a way that's transparent. Uh, and, uh, and that also makes sure that those who have claims that uh, need speedy access are able to access that justice in a faster way, Mr. Speaker. And so I would ask the member opposite to make sure that when she states her facts, that she does so in a way that, is, uh, that reflects uh, the facts, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Crown Liability and Proceeding Acts presumes a dismissed and extinguished 
all claims against the government that, uh, that are included. The wording goes, does go further than what the Supreme Court has said. Does the minister want to extinguish all claims that include the right of survivor of the 60s scoops, for example, to be prevented from suing the government, the rights of indigenous community who were deprived wrongly of their land in the past, or the current lawsuit by people that are seg in segregation for too long? Does the, is it, or eventually the people who are suffering flooding now from suing when indeed they would have been mistake in planning decisions. It is important for now and for the future that we protect the ability of Ontarians to sue their government when indeed they have been wrong. Question. That's just very necessary. The minister knows that this wording goes beyond the scope of the case law. Will she just go back to the drawing board and remove it, Appendix 17 so that there's more consultation on it? Members, please take their seats. The Attorney General to reply once again. You know, I'm very disappointed in the member opposite. Frankly, who knows that the people of Ontario have very have met many ways to bring cases against the Crown. In this case, our, what our, our policy does, what the legislation does, Mr. Speaker, is it, is it codifies existing case law set by the Supreme Court that states that good faith policy decisions by governments are not judiciable in this case, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there are various ways for people to bring cases against the Crown, Mr. Speaker, and the, and the member opposite is just letting the people of Ontario believe things that are not correct. The next question. The member for Simcoe North. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. Over the past few months, our government has been hard at work finding ways to improve Ontario's education system. We've modernized an outdated curriculum, we've taken steps to get spending on track, and we put a plan forward to make sure the best teachers are at the front of the classroom. Every day, we've been taking action to put student achievement back at the centre of all we do. Yet, despite these improvements, the opposition continues to fearmonger, especially when it comes to education. Shame. Can Shame. the Minister of Education share with the Legislature the details of the government's plan for teacher job protection? The Minister of Education. I very much appreciate the question coming from the member from Simcoe North. She works so hard on the, at the grassroots level, and you know what, how people are supporting what we're doing in education, and I appreciate this question very much because I absolutely appreciate having the opportunity to stand here today and reinforce our government's position when it comes to protecting jobs in Ontario. Despite what the opposition says, we are taking steps to protect. We are investing a historic $1.6 billion in attrition fu uh, protection funding. And it's attrition funding that will protect teachers from what the opposition is perpetuating. Speaker, this is so, so important because change is difficult, but we're going to work through it because the changes we're implementing have been asked for. We've listened to parents, we've listened to students, and quite frankly, we've listened to teachers as well. Response. And with this investment, I can't stress enough, no matter what rhetoric comes from the people opposite rhetoric. here, rhetoric. we are not Just going rhetoric. to lose one teacher job because of our proposed changes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you to the Minister for reaffirming her commitment to protecting jobs here in Ontario. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Education has been hard at work to get this province's education system back on track. But every step of the way, the opposition has been instilling fear in families and students and undermining the positive changes our government has been making. Can the Minister of Education tell the House the facts about the number of changes she has made to maximize student potential and achievement. Great question. Minister to reply once again. Well, thank you very much to the member from Simcoe North, because I just absolutely am adamant that our top priority and everyone on this side of the House and in government is, is absolutely dedicated to student here, achievement. Here, here, here. That is our number one priority, despite what the opposition says. 
and we're spending, we're increasing our investments in every regard to make sure that learning environment in the classroom is second to none and continues to lead around the globe. We're investing $13 billion over the next 10 years to build new schools and to repair and address the, re the needs that local schools have. And you know what? The opposition have been so wrong. You know, they were wrong about the $100 million that we invested in repairing schools. They were Once? wrong about the kindergarten. The, the kindergarten rhetoric. They were wrong about wrong so about much, Speaker. Right. But what we're doing and that they cannot deny is that we're getting education back on track. Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. Restart the clock. The next question is the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The government's unilateral cuts to public health will put public health and safety at risk. This scheme, cooked up in the back rooms without any warning or public consultation, is not about saving money, since public health is the most effective, cost-effective way to deliver better health outcomes. And it is certainly not about modernizing the healthcare system, as our public healthcare system is one of the best in the world after learning mistakes that led to Walkerton and SARS. Why is the minister going down this disastrous path that will put lives at risk? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for the question because it uh, provides me an opportunity to uh, tell the people of Ontario what is actually happening with the modernization of our public health units, aside from some of the overblown rhetoric and incorrect information that other people have put forward. In fact, what is happening is over three years we are modernizing the system. The City of Toronto is being asked to contribute one-third of one percent of their budget extra, which is 33 million in the first year going up to 42 million after three years. The sky is not falling in, Mr. Speaker. This is an amount that can be managed by the City of Toronto because the fact is, over the last several years, the City of Toronto Order. has accumulated millions of dollars in surplus funding for public health, so they will be able to find this money. And when you take a look at some of the Response. programs that are being provided, like breakfast programs for children, that will continue to be funded not through my ministry, but by the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. That's where that money comes from. That will continue. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I'd recognize the member for Parkdale High Park and then the government side tried to create a standing ovation. <laughs> Start the clock. Again, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Since the government first announced their cuts to public health, the Minister has failed to explain how she can guarantee that Ontarians won't be at risk if municipal governments are unable to find funding to pay for water inspections or respond quickly to a foodborne outbreak. School board officials, physicians, medical students, former deputy health minister, and even the former chief medical officer of health all have come forward to say these dangerous cuts will put people at risk. Does the Minister of Health believe she has greater expertise in public health than these people? Yeah. <laughs> Members, please take their seats. Minister to reply. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, what I would say to the member through you, Mr. Speaker, is it's a question of priorities. Now, I understand that the Department of Public Health in Toronto, Opposition come to order. in addition to running surpluses for a number of years, also had an entire department 
Alliance just for advocacy, also did a study on the um, health and safety ramifications of reinventing Young Street. Mr. Speaker, I think most people in Ontario would realize, the members certainly on this side and, and over here would understand that vaccinations for children are a priority, community breakfast programs are a priority, testing water is a priority, making sure students with special needs are supported. That's what I would be spending my money on if I was at the table. That's what they should be concentrating on. That would be Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Over the past week, a member of Toronto City Council has been pushing a narrative of outrage and indignation, which drives fear-mongering with overheated rhetoric and inaccurate information. To promote the city's own political agenda and push against our government, the councillor has stated numerous falsehoods that our government is reducing funding with, uh, with respect to the vital student nutrition program. Speaker, can the minister please correct the record and explain to this House what it is that our government is doing to continue supporting yes. the student nutrition program? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I'd like to thank the honourable member for her responsible question on an issue that is very important. Let me be perfectly clear. The statements made by the city councillor in Toronto, as well as the irresponsible opposition, are categorically false. The Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services invests $28.5 million into school nutrition programs across the province of Ontario, including over $8.5 million in the city of Toronto. I will challenge the members of the Toronto City Council to ensure that the money that flows from the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services for school breakfast Earth. programs in this city is maintained, and that they continue to uh, support that program and stop the fear-mongering, which is irresponsible and unacceptable. Thank you. I'm going to caution all the members on their um, inflammatory language. I'm going to ask the Minister for Children, Community and Social Services to withdraw. Sure. Withdrawn. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for bringing this information to the floor of the House and ensuring that accurate information is on the public record. Speaker, our government is continuing provincial funding to the student nutrition program, but this city councillor does not seem to take yes for an answer. Mm -hmm. Last week, TVO published an opinion piece on this, highlighting the funding breakdown of the school nutrition program, which Toronto contributes literally one one-thousandth of its budget to. The writer says, quote, keeping healthy food in schools is something that Toronto could do if council so chose, and also that only city council can put Toronto's school nutrition programs at risk. Speaker, can the minister please explain why city council should step up to the plate and help ensure this vital program continues? Minister, $5 million commitment to the City of Toronto through the Toronto Foundation for Student Success. That is a priority for this government. It is protecting what matters most, which are the children of this community. But let me be also perfectly clear. The rhetoric, the fear-mongering that has been engaged upon by the left is unhelpful, and it has riled people up when it's not indeed the, the facts are not true. And I'll give you one example, Speaker. This is a government that has increased funding in health care by $1.3 billion, yet the official opposition says we've cut it. This is a government that has increased funding in education by $700 million, yet the official opposition suggests there's a cut. This is a government that has invested an additional $300 million in social services, yet the opposition says it's a cut. The math on the other side of the Spons. aisle, Speaker, is atrocious and it contributes to fear mongering, which is unacceptable. Order. Order. Restart the clock. Member for Davenport. Hi, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. This afternoon, trustees from the province's largest school board, the Toronto District School Board, will meet to discuss the impact on classrooms following Friday's announcement of more cuts to education. The TDSB's preliminary analysis shows that the government's cuts will mean schools in Toronto will face a budget shortfall of at 
at least $21 million a year, but that real number could climb as high as $54 million. When the minister talks about change, does she mean fewer supports for students with special needs, fewer course options, the loss of teaching positions and EA positions? Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain how taking more resources away from students will help them succeed? Questions to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, I, I hope the member enjoyed her visit to the best riding in the province. It's a gorgeous riding on Ontario's west coast. And it was very hard that you came out for a visit. And that said, with regards to the, the question that was put, Speaker, I have to share with you, we want to work with our school boards. You know, the Toronto District School Board has a budget of almost $3 billion, and I am positive that we can work together with that school board to realize efficiencies at their administrative level because everyone in this house and across the province should always have student achievement as their number one priorities and you know it's interesting in that spirit of everyone coming together and working together i actually extended an invitation to our labor partners to start meeting as early as today so we can wow. put a stop to the Response. fear mongering and the anxiety being generated by the opposition party but unfortunately i haven't heard from anyone to date Wow. wow. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. That, that sounded a little bit like a threat to the TDSB minister. It is not only Order. students in urban schools who will be hurt by these deep cuts, as the minister knows. There will be even bigger impact on kids in Ontario's small and rural schools. As the minister noted, um, on, sad, on Friday, over 300 parents, students and education workers rallied outside her own constituency office calling on the government to halt this attack on public education. And I was fortunate to visit the beautiful riding of your on uh, last week at the invitation of her constituents. And I heard firsthand their concerns about how these cuts will mean teachers are able to provide less support and fewer course options and the viability of smaller Question. schools being at risk. Speaker, will the minister listen to her own constituents and stop these cuts. Members will take their seats. Once again, the Minister of Education to reply. Well, again, Speaker, I'm very pleased to stand in this House and say we're going to be modernizing education in Ontario and getting it back on track, all the while making sure student achievement is our number one priority. And I truly, sincerely hope that the Labour partners and our education partners, our school boards, are going to be working with us. Because, you know, it's interesting. When we listen to our stakeholders throughout this province, from one corner to another, we've heard loud and clear uh, teachers, three to parents. They're saying, hey, what about the boards? What can the school boards do to realize some efficiencies? And, and what can they do to make sure that the focus remains on student achievement? And let Order. me be perfectly clear. The nonsense coming from that member office about threats is ridiculous. I want to work with partners. I am ready to get to the table. I'm ready to get to work. I am absolutely Spons. ashamed of the nonsense coming from across the floor. We are a government that are prepared prepared to get to work as of today because teachers, students and parents Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. Order. The House will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Solicitor General. Ontario's government for the people was elected with a mandate to improve public safety across this province and to provide our hard-working frontline officers in our correctional facilities with the tools and the resources that they need to perform their duties safely and effectively. Mr. Speaker, correctional officers have a challenging job, and the need for a new inst institution in Thunder Bay is clear. While in opposition, the PC party called for a new facility in Thunder Bay to ensure that staff, inmates, and the community were safe. 
Mr. Speaker, could the Solicitor General please update the members of this Legislature on the status of this new facility? The question is to the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the uh, interest from the member from Sault Ste. Marie. You know, he's absolutely right that uh, there's no doubt our frontline correctional officers and staff work hard each and every day to keep our communities safe, protect our families, and make sure that the inmates that are in our prisons are protected. While in Thunder Bay last week, I was pleased to join the Minister of Infrastructure to highlight our government's commitment to move ahead with building a new, modern correctional complex that will keep correctional staff safe and better protect the people of Ontario. I want to uh, reinforce that this facility will reflect our government's vision for building a more effective, efficient and responsive corrections system with staff well-being and public protection front and centre. Thunder Bay Correctional Complex will be a model in a correctional system that serves its purpose to keeping our families safe, defending victims and holding criminals accountable Response. for their actions. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for confirming the government's support for a new correctional facility in Thunder Bay. This is good news for the people of Northern Ontario and across our province. Reckless and irresponsible spending by the previous Liberal government left the people with a $15 billion deficit. The Liberals put essential services that people rely on, including community safety, at risk. In the government's 2019 Ontario budget, tough choices had to be made to protect what matters most. Few things matter more than the security of the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please tell the House how this new facility in Thunder Bay will improve public safety, protect staff on the Question. job, and provide inmates with comprehensive rehabilitation services. Independent members come to order. Solicitor General will reply again. To the Minister of Infrastructure. Sure. To the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you to the member from uh, Sault Ste. Marie for that ex excellent question and, and leadership on this issue. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last week I had the pleasure of joining uh, the Solicitor General in Thunder Bay uh, to make this important announcement. It was also great uh, to see our friend, uh, the MPP, uh, Michael Gravel, uh, there too for this important announcement. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, courts and jails like this one help make our communities safe for people. That's why our government is committed to investing in the province's infrastructure. New correctional facilities like this one let in more natural light, create spaces for education and skills training, have more mental health units, will be equipped with scanning technology to prevent smuggled contraband, and will include cultural features throughout the facility. Most importantly, as the Solicitor General said, the new Thunder Bay Correctional Complex will minimize risk to staff while also increasing efficiency. Correction staff do challenging work, and on behalf of our government, I want to thank them for their service to all of our communities. Thank you. Good job. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Tessa Day, a 13-year-old from Portland Public School in Kitchener Centre, is with us in the gallery today. Her teacher gave her class an assignment. You slam poetry to write about something you care about and she decided to write about education. Here's a part of her poem. You don't see all the children with dreams. You don't even hear their screams. You're just taking money from the ones who need it most. You just want to boast. Mr. Speaker, Tessa is telling this government that Ontario children, including the most marginalized, should be our top priority. Will the minister reverse the cuts that are putting Tessa's education at risk? Question is to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much. And Tessa, welcome to Queen's Park. And I appreciate that you've taken a, an interesting form of art to share your ideas and thoughts. Don't stop doing that ever, because we need people like you standing up and, and expressing yourself, because it allows a proper dialogue to happen. And I'm glad you're here, because I have to share you, share with you, excuse me. I need to be very clear. 
we are not cutting in education. We're investing. We're investing $700 million this year alone in education. We're increasing student transportation. We're increasing francophone language. We're increasing, for example, $90, or $90 million in special Order. education needs. You know, Tessa, we, I have young people in my family. I think about my stepkids' kids. I think about the young people in my community. Response? And if we're making these decisions to make sure that you are our number one priority priority and your student achievement remains every cent. Stop the clock. I'm going to ask the member for Toronto St. Paul's to withdraw her unparliamentary remark. Withdraw. Government side, come to order. Withdraw. There's still some time left on the clock. I'm going to remind all members to make their comments and direct their comments through the chair. Restart this, the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the minister. Tessa's insights are possible because of organizations like Harmony Movement, which provides equity and inclusion training to students and to teachers. Harmony has worked with both the Waterloo Region District School Board and their Catholic Board, and it's work like theirs which has sparked creativity and compassion in students just like Tessa. Harmony Movement is here with us today, but they're being forced to close their doors after 25 years because of the minister's attack on diversity and equity programming. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell Tessa and the teachers that Tessa works with where her teachers will be receiving training that will build inclusion and equity in Ontario schools now that Harmony Movement will have to close their doors? Members, please take your seats. Again, the Minister of Education. To thank you very much. And again, thank you for being here. My number one priority is, as Minister of Education, realizing, uh, helping students realize their dreams. And, Speaker, everything we do in this government is going to make sure, through education, students do have a chance to achieve their dreams. And the fact of the matter is, there was a lot of waste and mismanagement in the previous government during 15 years of liberal. Position come to order. Liberal chaos in the education system. Schools. And so we're, pre, we're rebranding and refocusing on student achievement. And the These fact of the matter is we are going to be looking at priorities and partnerships on the way forward. Priorities and partnerships, not education and other funding that proved Fonts. to be a slush fund for special liberal projects. We are going to be absolutely ensuring student success and not one teacher will lose their job because of our proposed changes. Thank you very much. Next question is the member for Brantford Grant. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Farming is a very rewarding career, but it also has its own unique challenges and stresses. At this busy time of year, farmers often struggle with destructive factors that are beyond their control, such as pests or weather. Farmers often work long hours alone, keeping their worries close to their chests, and this is especially true as our farmers are entering planting season. When it comes to mental health, far too many of our farmers suffer in silence. It is critical that farmers have mental health resources, not just the planting season, but all year round. Can the minister please tell this House about the work our government is doing to ensure farmers have the mental health supports that they need? Minister of Agriculture, Food thank and Rural Affairs. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Brantford Brant for his important question. I'm proud of the work that our government has done to increase awareness of mental health issues in the agriculture industry. I would like to thank all the farmers who shared the personal stories of our mental health roundtables, and I'm grateful for our partnership with the University of Guelph on this issue and for the fantastic research led by Dr. Andrea Jones-Bitton. 
I also want to thank everyone from our farm organizations who participated in our spring planting mental health video campaign for sharing their advice and personal care strategies. I want to encourage any farmer who may need help not to suffer in silence. Take care of yourself. Take a step back and put your mental health first during this busy time. I ask all those in the agriculture community to look out for their friends, neighbours and family members who may be struggling and reach out a hand to help. Yes. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. I understand the member for Guelph has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm right up. Welcome to my constituents here to Queen's Park today. Leah LaHaye and Robert Duarte, welcome to Queen's Park. I'd also like to take a moment to give a big shout out to Peter Beaven Baker and the PEI Greens for making Canadian history and electing the first official opposition by the Green Party in Canadian history. Member for Waterloo on a point of order. Point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As you know, Wilfrid Laurie University is here today. They're hosting a reception in room 222-223. Uh, please come by and find out what amazing work is going on at this university. Thank you very much. Point of order, the Minister for Training, Colleges and Universities. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I believe you will find that we have unanimous consent for a moment of silence to honour the life of Wilfrid Laurier's Dean of Students, Leanne Holland Brown who was tragically killed in an accident last week. Thank you. Mr. Training Colleges and Universities is seeking unanimous consent of the House to have a moment's silence in memory of the Wilfrid Laurier University Dean of Students who tragically passed Agreed. away last week. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.